coming up on Primetime News. President Pakana calls North Korea's recent landmine blasts a clear military provocation as South Korea and the U.S. kick off a joint military exercise. More revelations over Japan's wartime atrocities. China reveals a document that shows the Japanese military forced 2,000 Korean women to work as sex slaves in the 1940s. Plus, Lute Holdings shareholders back the founder of Lute's younger son as he fights his brother for control of the corporation. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello and welcome to Primetime News on this Monday, August 17th. I'm Hwang ji -hae. And I'm Daniel Chan. Thank you for joining us. South Korea and the United States launched their combined military exercise today known as the Ulchi Freedom Guardian. And North Korea ratchets up tensions between the two Koreas by resuming a loudspeaker campaign against the South. Kim hyun bin starts us off. The Ulchi Freedom Guardian, which will run through August 28th, is aimed at helping the Allies better react to the wide range of threats posed by Pyongyang. The drills involve about 50,000 South Korean and 30,000 American troops in a war game that simulates a North Korean invasion. Officials say Pyongyang was informed of the Allies' plans on Saturday through loudspeakers at Panmunjom, the truth village inside the DMZ. North Korea has a history of condemning the drills, calling them practice for an invasion of the North. This year is no different as Pyongyang threatened over the weekend to take strong military counteractions against the U.S. if the drills proceed. In response to the Ulti Freedom Guardian exercise, we will take intense and appropriate counterattack measures. North Korea has also resumed anti Seoul broadcasts at the border, further heightening tensions between the two Koreas. The move is seen as a response to South Korea bringing back anti Pyongyang broadcasts. The South started sending messages across the border with loudspeakers after two South Korean soldiers were injured by landmines in the DMZ. A South Korean military official say, the North's broadcasts are aimed at preventing its people from hearing the South's anti-Pyongyang broadcast, rather than conveying messages across the border. South Korea's defense ministry says it has strengthened its security level in case of any additional provocations from the North. Kim Hyun bin Arirang News. On this first day of the joint military drill, President Park Geun-hye chaired a cabinet meeting where she highlighted South Korea's strong deterrence in the face of continuing security threats from North Korea. Choi Yoo-sun reports. President Park Geun-hye has said North Korea illegally crossed the DMZ to plant landmines, which recently exploded and injured two South Korean soldiers. She then called the attack a clear military provocation. President Park also said she hopes the two soldiers recover quickly. The president led a cabinet meeting Monday, the first day of Seoul and Washington's annual Ulti Freedom Guardian exercise. She highlighted South Korea's need for a strong sense of security and deterrence in the wake of North Korea's continued military threats. President Park said the military exercise is an opportunity to gauge the South's readiness to protect public safety and national security, and she ordered the military to guarantee South Koreans feel protected in their daily lives. Referring to this year's inclusion of drills to counter cyber and bioterrorism attacks, President Park called for actual training against threats involving biological weapons, infectious diseases and cyber attacks. The president also asked officials to provide fire extinguisher and CPR training for Korean citizens to boost the country's emergency response efforts. Ahead of the cabinet meeting, the president chaired a closed-door National Security Council meeting held annually during the Ulji Freedom Guardian drills. Choi Yoo-sun, Arirang News. Moving on to some politics news, the chairman of South Korea's ruling and opposition parties have clashed over a proposal to lift sanctions imposed on North Korea in 2010. The opposition party leader also suggested the sanctions be dropped and urged President Park to attend a war memorial ceremony in China. Ji Myung-gil reports. 
The ruling Saenuri Party's chief, Kim Musong, said Monday it would be inappropriate to request that President Park Geun-hye lift the set of measures imposed on Pyongyang at this time. I don't think it is appropriate to suggest lifting the May 24th sanctions on North Korea if we consider the 46 South Korean soldiers that were killed in the torpedoing of a naval ship in 2010 and the recent landmine provocation by the North at the DMZ. Kim's remarks come a day after his main opposition party counterpart Moon Jae-in said the rival party should jointly submit a proposal to the president, suggesting the lifting of the May 24th sanctions. Moon on Monday said he regretted Kim's decision and also urged President Park to visit Beijing next month to attend China's celebrations of the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. President Park Geun-hye should attend China's war memorial ceremony to show that South Korea is willing to lead Northeast Asia and create an atmosphere of reconciliation through its diplomacy initiatives. This can only be possible by improving relations with North Korea. China has invited world leaders to attend a huge military parade on September 3rd that will celebrate Japan's surrender in World War II. However, many Western leaders will likely refrain from attending the ceremony to avoid involvement in China's rivalry with Japan. Kim young Arirang News. In other news, more evidence giving weight to why Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe should have included a reference to his country's wartime sex crimes and an apology to its victims during his statement last week. China recently unveiled some documents that reveal the extent of Japan's shocking history of wartime atrocities. And according to Arkani Kim, there's more to come. It's been revealed that the Japanese military coerced 2,000 Korean women into sexual slavery in the 1940s. A record office in China's northeast Heilongjiang province on Monday revealed a Japanese document that detailed the drafting of Koreans to work at comfort stations in several regions throughout China in 1941. The record also disclosed that Korean women were deceived into serving at comfort stations disguised as restaurants as well as detailing locations of sites and the permitted service time for Japanese soldiers. The revelation follows a Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's statement on Friday where he didn't give a direct apology to the so-called comfort yes, women. China's efforts to pressure Japan to face its historical wrongdoings continued with its state's archives administration, releasing a video series about Japan's abuse of women during wartime on Saturday. On the first day of its eight-day series, it released a Japanese soldier's testimony recalling a Chinese woman being killed and eaten by soldiers during the invasion of the Shandong Peninsula. The second video in the series, unveiled on Sunday, showed evidence of 141 women forced to serve some 25,000 Japanese troops stationed in Nanjing. The Chinese Archives Administration is set to release six more installments of the series as part of efforts to show that the Japanese military systematically kidnapped women and operated brothels. Connie Kim, Arirang News. It looks like we're close to having a clear winner in the Lotte Group family power feud. Shareholder of its uh, de facto holding company held a vote today approving management plans proposed by current CEO Shin Dongbin. For more on the possibility of the younger son taking over, let's turn to our Song Ji-san. At a crucial extraordinary meeting held in Tokyo, Lotte holding shareholders back the current CEO of the group Shin Dong-bin to manage the conglomerate that operates both in Korea and Japan. Approving the reform agendas proposed by the younger Shin, Lotte Holdings announced that the shareholders would like to see managed group in a more stable and transparent way. Lotte, the country's fifth largest conglomerate, has been mired in a succession feud between the 93-year-old founder Shin Yakus two sons. Shin Dong-bin, who oversees businesses running Korea, has steadily built his control over both bases over the past month, while Tongju, who had his father's support, was removed from his posts in Tokyo by the board supporting his younger brother. After winning initial approval from the shareholders at the meeting, which lasted less than an hour, the CEO also drew a clear line between company issues and family matters, and the two should not be mixed together, 
and that the company should be operated on the basis of law and order. Although chances are slimmer now, industry watchers say the big brother Shin Dongju will seek to reclaim his control, arguing that the way his younger brother grabbed the reins over the group was not legitimate. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. Party floor leader for the New Politics Alliance for Democracy, Lee jong vows to focus on improving the people's livelihoods for the remainder of the current assembly. In a press conference on Monday to mark his 100th day in office, he stressed continued support of small and mid-sized businesses as the future core of the Korean economy. He also vowed to protect the rights of employees and put an end to unfair practices forced onto the labor sector. The four-term opposition party lawmaker also had sharp words for political rivals. He criticized the ruling Henry Party and the presidential office for their lack of communication and called for better negotiations with the main opposition bloc. Now, Samsung Group says it will create 30,000 new jobs for young people over the next two years to improve the country's youth unemployment problem. Korea's leading conglomerate said Monday that it will provide the jobs in various ways with the help of its subsidiaries. Samsung will hire 3,000 trainees who will be able to apply for a position at Samsung Affiliates after four years. It also aims to create 10,000 new positions by 2017 through new investments. The move is in tune with the government's efforts to better the job market for young Koreans. The unemployment rate among those between the ages 15 and 29 came in over 9 percent in July, posting the highest rate since the Asian financial crisis of the late 1990s. In the 21st century, smartphones have become an extension of our palm, and smartphone usage is, of course, becoming more prevalent throughout the world. Naturally, the mobile advertising market is a sector that has been profiting from that growth. But some warn of developments that may end up lowering that boom. Our Kim Min-ji has this report. The global mobile advertisement market is reaping the profits. According to a joint report by IAB Europe and IHS Technology, the revenue from the global mobile advertisement market amounted to 31.9 billion U.S. dollars in 2014. That's up nearly 65 percent from the previous year. By segment, mobile display generated nearly half of the revenue, or $15.1 billion. It was followed by mobile search with 46 percent and messaging with 7 percent share. The North American region accounted for the biggest proportion of the market at about 45 percent, or $14.3 billion. It was followed by the Asia-Pacific region at nearly 37 percent and Europe at about 17 percent. But posing a possible threat to the market, a separate report says ad-blocking software could cost online publishers losses of over $20 billion in revenue this year. Currently, nearly 200 million people worldwide are using ad blockers online, which is an increase of more than 40 percent from June last year. The report warned of a game changer this fall when Apple launches its iOS 9, a new mobile operating system. It will allow the development of ad blocking apps supported by mobile Safari, which currently makes up more than half of the global mobile browsing market. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Shifting gears to a different story now, there's some good news for those planning to travel abroad next month. For the first time in six years, passengers buying tickets for international flights in September will not have to pay a fuel surcharge. The extra fee is imposed based on the average price of fuel traded on Singapore's spot market. When the price falls below 150 cents per gallon, it's not levied. The latest data shows an average fuel price of 146 cents for the period between July 16th and August 15th, the period used to determine the surcharge for September. In August, passengers paid around $14 in fuel surcharges. For domestic routes, the September surcharge is expected to drop to about $2. And some sporting news for now. This man loves the game, the beautiful game, Joga Bonita or soccer. Former FIFA Vice President Chong Mong Jun has officially announced his bid for the top seat in the world of football, and he promises transparency. Will he become the first Asian to head the organization that is mired in controversy and corruption right now? Our Shin Zemin gives us the details. 
Former FIFA Vice President Chung Mong Jun officially launched his formal campaign for presidency of the organization, promising to clean up the football's governing body if he gets elected. Speaking at a news conference in Paris on Monday, Chung said he's just the right man to lead FIFA, which is currently undergoing a profound crisis. Without mincing words, he also criticized Sepp Blatter and vowed to fix the scandal-ridden organization. Organizations begin to corrupt when the leader thinks he is indispensable. If I'm elected, I will serve only one term, four years. I can change FIFA in four years. The veteran figure in South Korean football, who's also the billionaire head of Hyundai Group, believes the time is ripe for change. We now live in a different era. FIFA needs to reflect the different reality. Continuity is very important, but so is change. Promising to enhance checks and balances between FIFA's leadership and judicial bodies, Chung also vowed to create better financial transparency if he wins election in February. He also laid out increased and smoother distribution of financial assistance to national football federations. With over a decade of experience as an administrator in FIFA and the Korea Football Association, Chung was a front-runner in bringing the World Cup to Korea back in 2002 when it co-hosted the event with Japan. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. For the top international headlines, we turn to our Isano at the News Center. Today's focus, rescue teams struggled to get to an Indonesian plane crash site. Protesters in Tianjin understandably demand answers and compensation regarding last week's deadly blast. And Japan's economy shrinks in the second quarter. But first, Sano, let's turn to Indonesia, where bad weather has been hampering search and rescue efforts. What's the latest from officials there? Well, recovery teams were headed to Papua on Monday, where the wreckage of the missing Trigana plane was reportedly spotted. But efforts teams on the grounds have been moving slowly due to erratic and heavy rains. So far, what we do know is that all passengers on board were Indonesian nationals, but it's not known if anyone survived. And the plane's black boxes have yet to be located. The flight was also carrying 470,000 U.S. dollars in cash to distribute to needy families in the eastern province. Our Kim ji has more. An Indonesian passenger plane carrying 54 people has been found crashed in the mountainous part of the country. A government official confirmed the Trianga Air Service plane had been found in the Oktabe district of the Papua region. Details are still filtering through, but the official says villagers reported seeing the plane smash into the side of a mountain. According to the information, the Tragana Air aircraft that lost contact was found at Camp 3 Okbabe district in the Pintang Mountains Regency. The information provided by the local residents said that the flight crashed into Tanguk Mountain. The detail on this finding is still under investigation. The domestic flight carrying 44 adult passengers, five children and five crew members lost contact with air traffic control on Sunday afternoon local time without making a distress call. A detailed search effort was called off late Sunday as well as the following day on Monday due to inclement weather. How long the search is conducted depends on the weather, I guess. The important thing is that we know the approximate location, so we will focus our search efforts there. Air transport is commonly used despite Indonesia's patchy aviation record, since land travel is often impossible in the island country. Indonesia has already seen two major plane crashes in the past year, prompting the government to introduce stricter safety regulations. Kim ji Arirang News. And turning to China, the death toll from the deadly blast that rocked the port city of Tianjin last Wednesday has now surpassed 100, with 95 people still missing. Citizens are now protesting against authorities, demanding compensation and answers. Area residents near the explosion site held banners that read, Give back our homes. They marched towards a hotel where government officials were holding a news conference on Monday. 
Now our homes have been destroyed. Can't the government give us an explanation? You can't just tell us all you are going to do is give us new windows. City officials promised a thorough investigation and look into whether any regulations were violated. They have acknowledged the presence of toxins at the site, but insist they don't pose a health risk to those outside the two-kilometer evacuation zone. The disaster sent massive fireballs into the sky, sending down fiery debris on an industrial zone. 700 people remain hospitalized, while most of those missing are said to be firefighters. And lastly, Japan's economy shrank in the second quarter as demand fell for Japanese goods overseas and household spending dropped. According to data released Monday by the Cabinet Office, Japan's GDP contracted 1.6 percent on an annualized basis in the April to June quarter. Exports took the largest hit, falling by 16.5 percent over the same period. Car exports to China fell more than 30 percent. Japan's weak yen also drove up the price of food, causing households to consume less. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has promised to lift the economy out of decades of deflation, but a sustainable recovery continues to elude his administration. The data has increased speculation the Bank of Japan may expand a stimulus package later this year. And that does it for your international news at this hour. I'll see you again tomorrow. This Monday got off to a much cooler and breezier start, but the scorching heat has yet to let up. It was a sweltering day under sunny skies. In fact, a heat wave advisory is in place again here in Seoul and the surrounding areas since this afternoon. And tomorrow is shaping up to be just as hot or even hotter than Daegu with highs surging to 33 degrees Celsius here in the capital. And the UV index will also jump up to high to very high levels across the nation. So be sure to stay protected from the strong sunshine at all times and stay hydrated. On that note, let's take a closer look at the readings for tomorrow. Seoul will hit a high of 33 degrees Celsius and Daegu and Gwangju will climb up to 32 while Busan hits 29 tomorrow afternoon. And as for the other regions, Tijan and Jeju Island will see a high of 32 and 28, while Dokdo rises to 27. Now, tomorrow should actually be the hottest day of the season for here in the capital. We have relief on the way. The mercury will gradually start to drop on Wednesday, uh, starting to uh, drop down to 20s by the end of the week. And it seems like Friday, we are expecting a nationwide showers. Well, that's all for Korea, and here is international weather for years around the world. And that brings us to the end of our newscast. Hope you are adjusting to the new work week nicely. Thank you so much for staying with us. We'll be back tomorrow, same time. Goodbye for now.